there's some classic studies. Um, Peter Marler, who's sort of the father of all that kind of research, uh, song learning, showed that, yeah, if you took, for example, a song sparrow and tutored it with another species, um, it would learn, okay, so if it's alone, it will sing a song, but it's not gonna really sound like a song sparrow song. It, it's you know gonna be kind of a weird song. Um, if it hears its father, it will sing a proper song sparrow song. If it gets a song from another species, it won't sound like either um, a song sparrow, it won't sound like a bird that was raised alone, and it won't sound like that species. So some of it is learned, but you're right, there is a genetic component. They are prepared to learn a certain type of song. And if they're presented with the wrong tutor, they're not going to learn that tutor song, but they're not going to sing the proper song of the species either. So yeah, it's a combination. And I suppose the, the, the song of the species evolves just like a rabbit. Does that happen quickly? Like 20 years when we notice the evolution of the song? Yeah, so how quickly do song dialects change? You know, I can't put a number on that, but there are certainly um, species that have been separated, you know, maybe by a mountain range, um, same species, but they do start to sing slightly different songs. Part of that is a learned thing, and I, I do think that you know, if it's recently heard, they could learn probably properly the song dialect, but at some point it is going to change, and I can't put a number on that, but that is the idea, that over time it's going to change. So, did you have a question? Uh, here's my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's easy. Did you have something? Yeah, I was going to ask you about the diachronic change, too, because if there is some chronic variation, suspect that, that it was caused by that Yeah. And so, I mean, can you actually, at least hypothetically, trace from existing songs to sort of reconstruct ancestor songs? I mean, are there systematic ways that they change? You can tell he's a linguist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we, I mean, you could look at, the, you know, different species. I mean, well, same species, but you can look at the different dialects, you know, across, you know, States of different dialects and different songbirds, uh, but when do they split off and become new species, and what elements of song do they share? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with the research on that. I'm sure that people have studied that type of thing. I mean, I know that um, I knew somebody studying in Australia these different songbird species, and they would have um, quite, they, they were still inbreeding kind of at the boundaries, and they'd have a distinct song over here, a distinct song over here, and then they'd interbreed, and they'd sing something that was sort of in between. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, maybe something like that. Um, but yeah, people are you know, definitely in this field of research interested in that. Um, one thing I want to mention too is that um, there are studies showing that, I'm talking about um, social responses to song and, and how that can reward song. It can also change the kind of song a male will sing. If you look at cowbirds, who, cowbirds are nest parasites, right? So the eggs hatch in a species, if, you know, if it's not a cowbird species, yet they have to learn the song. So that's unique. They don't have their father tutoring them. Um, but what they found is there's some good work by Meredith Wait, Weston. What, what are cowbirds? Cowbirds are, are nest parasites. Like cuckoos. Yeah, so the they eggs... They push out the others. That's right, the female will lay her eggs in the nests of other songbirds. Oh, yeah. All right, so they're not raised by cowbirds, so they don't have a father tutor there, so it's, it's a very different species. But um, when males are singing courtship songs to females, um, there's a group in Indiana who discovered that females will respond to certain parts of certain songs and not others. And the male will sing, he'll try out this song, he'll try out that song, she'll flip her wing. And if she flips the wing, then he'll keep that element of song. And he'll keep singing that element. If she flips her wing again, He'll incorporate that element. So females are training the males to sing it in that instance, which is really interesting. So basically the females sitting there going like this. She's like, okay, I'll go for that. She's like, all right, all right. The female cowbirds basically they're instruct training. the male on how to sing the right song. In that case, they're right training. Eh, I don't go for that. And so the male has to learn from experience. Yes. Um, I belong to a social group, which is mainly people that grew up in the Midwest. We all have the Garrison Keeler thing where you know, we don't want to put ourselves forward too much. Except that there's one person in the group who's originally from New York, where apparently the social mores are, are that you keep talking until somebody interrupts you. And so we have any number of gatherings where as soon as he shows up, he starts talking, and nobody else says a thing for the next hour. Because you don't want to interrupt. <laughs> because you don't want to interrupt. You're, you're, trained, you're trained not to interrupt somebody. I'm wondering if there's anything akin to this in birds. Is there the sort of thing where it's my turn to sing now, you shut up? 
Do they do that? Let's see, do they take turns singing? Well, you know, there's some good literature, uh, sort of in frogs, where they, they try to insert, you know, they, they try to time things so that they can be heard. Um, and, and songbirds as well. I mean, I think that they'll, they'll sing to try to fill the gaps. Um, but what I was thinking is there's, um, well, I don't know, maybe this doesn't relate, but it, it's sort of, when you talk about someone who's, who's trying out something that doesn't work for the rest of the group, I guess in bower birds, it looks like males try to court the females, and sometimes they're too aggressive. The female will avoid that male, and she will train him also to back off. Um, and so I suppose, you know, over time, I guess it wouldn't work in this case. Because I was thinking, you know, if, 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 he, if he interrupted you, you'd eventually learn that, okay, when he interrupts, it change. But since you're not interrupting, he's not going to do any learning and adjust his, yeah. Uh, but definitely animals will time their vocalizations. They also will sing at, at times of the day. Um, they think one reason that you have this dawn chorus is because the air is, um, is really good at conducting bird song early in the morning. So birds are singing a dawn chorus at four in the morning because that's a good time for sound to travel. And so they're very good also at sort of timing the vocalizations so that they can be heard as well. And you can imagine that there's all kind of anthrop anthropogenic noise, so human noise that's messing up songbirds. And songbirds who are living in cities will vocalize at, at you know, higher the volume. They, they vocalize louder than they would otherwise, which people are really interested in studying as well. Do they also have um, vocabularies for different situations, especially like predator threats and things like that, the way a lot of other animals do. They have a vocalization yeah, like the, to the let the other ones know there's a predator. For that. Birds will definitely use calls. And chickadees, for example, they're local. Um, they've got a mobbing call where they call others together to sort of mob, like if there's a crow or a hawk in the area, they can mob. And so there's a mobbing call. There would be a call if there's a predator. So if there's a hawk, there's a certain vocalization that the chickadee will make. Um, they have another vocalization, like you may know if you go on you know, outside, you can hear chickadee. And there's some evidence that the number of Ds, there's a postdoc in my lab who's really interested in chickadees, so I've learned a lot about them recently. But the number of Ds has something to do with maybe, I mean, people are still studying this, the size of the intruder. And one thing that we have found that's interesting with starlings is since they're mimics, they will mimic other bird species. And um, the research specialist in my lab, she kept saying, they are, they're sounding like red-tailed hawks, but they only do this when I present them with a male. So we had male starlings, and we present them with a female, they'd sing courtship song. We present them with a male, they'd sing, and presumably that's to repel a rival. And so she said, they make these hawk calls when I present them with a male. They don't make as many hawk calls when I present them with a female. And she said, I think hawks are threatening, and they're using that to repel males. And um, so I said, well, let's quantify this. So she did a study where she presented males with males and males with females. So the same males got the female and the male. And we do see more hawk calls when we present with males. I mean, it's substantial. It's probably twice as many hot calls. And I have not published this. We've only, I only realized this probably three days ago. And so we've got to look into this because I think it's fascinating. I mean, but they, they, they had to learn that hawk's call Well, somewhere, they had they? to learn that. And so I met um, someone who was interviewing for a faculty position. He said, well, then could you get them to quack like a duck? So <laughs> right if you presented a duck as threatening, would they quack to males instead of making a hot call? But how are you going to make a duck threatening? Well, that would, yeah. You throw it with the right drugs, it'll... You're going to have to give it a gun or something. Threat, you know. It's not a mean loaded duck. Dress, dress, him up like a, dress him up in gang colors or something. <laughs> but now we're thinking, you know, it would be really interesting. Can we get a starling to, maybe not literally quack like a duck, but could we alter the vocalization he produces that would be threatening? And, and I don't know, because That's, it was only yeah. three days ago. She mentioned this, and she'd been quantifying it, but I only looked at the data <laughs> last week, and I thought, oh, she's, she's right, and I don't... So I have to look into this a little bit more. I think there have been some studies where they think, I forget which species it was, where they think an animal is, is mimicking, say, or I'm maybe mimicking, uh, now, giving an alarm call to try to fool the other animals. Like, man. And he's found some food Jason. and he doesn't want competition, so he'll give an alarm call to try to get the There's other There's definitely deception like that. that occurs in yeah. different animal species. And um, the, there are, I'm not sure about the alarm call. Yes, yeah, so, so whether well, he's making a hawk call, might he be trying to fool this other male into thinking that there's a hawk? Well, that's what I think might be going on. Yeah. I mean, deception is, is interesting because there are different, um, 
there's sort of constraints that prevent deception because you could say, could the poor quality male just sing a good song? I mean, it's costly, but it, it may not be that costly. Um, I had a bird once that was very thin, and he would just teeter over the perch, and he'd still sing his head off. And he was obviously he was sick. Something was wrong with him, and, and we treated him. He was fine, but at the time he would just barely crawl on the perch, and he'd still sing at a high rate. Um, but so there's certain, there are there's a good literature on what are the costs associated with singing behavior, and you know predation is a cost, um, and and also in some species you just can't produce a high quality vocalization unless you're a high quality individual. Like frogs produce a very attractive song when they're large. Well, if you're large, you can produce that song that call. If you're small, you can't. Um, with songbirds, it seems like um, testosterone might be the factor that's important. So if um, a starling wants to sing a courtship song, he has to have high concentrations of testosterone. But testosterone is costly. It is physiological, physiologically taxing. And so only the strongest male can have high testosterone, and only the strongest male then can sing an attractive song. So it seems that if you're a low quality male, you simply physiologically can't produce a song. But with the call literature, I don't know. But that's, I mean, that's what we're wondering if it's what's going on is that it saves the male energy. He doesn't have to fight off a male arrival. He can incorporate a hot call and that guy leaves. And so if, if we're right, I mean, if this turns out, I mean, that would, be, that would be fascinating. So I hope we have to follow it up now that three days ago I finally looked at the data. Do you ever, oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. You got a question? Well, then I'll. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I'll get it back. Do you, do you ever manipulate the levels of testosterone to see that? We have, I mean, we um, look at males with low versus high testosterone, and we measure it. You can just simply take a But you don't, like, inject them or anything, or sort of well, change your model. Yeah, so in fall, they have very low concentrations of testosterone. As fall is the photo period again. So when day lengths are short, it's, it's really low. Um, we will sometimes give them a testosterone implant to make sure that the testosterone is high in spring when we need it to be high. Because when they're in the aviary, I mean, you talked a little bit about captive situation can change things. Um, when they're in captivity, testosterone will drop naturally because they're in captivity. They don't have their natural situation. We have them in nice aviaries, you know, with branches and perches, and, and they sing very readily. They don't even, we don't even seem to bother them much once they're comfortable with us. Uh, but yeah, we will give them testosterone as well. And we always measure testosterone. You can take a serum blood sample and just measure the testosterone. And, and usually it seems like if, it's, if they have high testosterone, they will sing quite a bit. If they have really low testosterone, they don't sing much. But in between, it's not like a linear thing. It almost is like a threshold. Once they reach a certain level, they're going to sing. And below that, they won't. So. Oh, I remember. <laughs> As an you were saying that um, the males, uh, the female can tell if the male is older and more distinguished, has a better nest site, and the female can pick a more fit male. But that more fit male, how does he ensure a fit female? So with the starlings, uh, with songbirds in general, they are biparental, so both parents will raise the offspring and you know provide food and build the nests. Uh, and so there, in some species, not in starlings, there is data showing that when the female gets a male that has the complex repertoire, that he is um, a better father, that he will make more trips bringing food to the nests. And they did not find that with starlings. Um, a friend of mine actually did a study, um, Deb Duffy, where she looked at um, immune markers of immune function. And what she found is that uh, if you looked at correlations between testosterone and immune function, males with the best immune system had the highest concentrations of testosterone. Wait, they sang more. I might be conflating her data. But in the end, what she found is that males that sang at the highest rates, uh, the longest song belts, tended to have the best immune systems by these different measures that she was using. And those are the males that females preferred. So female starlings really like a long song. That is a really good predictor of, of male mating success. If he sings a long song, they'll get a female. And those males tend to have the best immune systems by her different markers. Um, and so that's how the female would, you know, she'll get a male with a good immune system, and that's something that, you know, she can pass on her offspring, or at least she's not going to have parasites in the nest. Right. But how does the male ensure that he doesn't get a female? Oh, so that, that's a good question. And so that's Most males that, don't care, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> the starlings are, it does seem like, what we found is we can, um, females get yellow beaks when they have estradiol that's high and they're ready to breed. Um, and females will have black beaks when estradiol is low and it's fall. We've presented male starlings with yellow beak or black beak. Males go for either female.